If you landed on this video, you're probably concerned about raw milk, public health, or both. The topic of raw milk is underspoken, but it's important to consider in relation to what we can and can't buy to support our health. We assume we have the freedom to buy whatever we want to eat, and we also assume that the ingredients of whatever we choose to eat will give us nourishment and won't harm us or outright kill us. You'd pretty much be correct in assuming that we have the right to choose what foods to eat. But what if I told you we don't really have a choice? Not if you want to drink raw milk anyway. Now, you might think that milk in general is bad for you, that humans can't digest it, that all farms are hell on earth for animals, or that humans are meant to milk almonds, cashews, rice, or soybeans. Which is good. We all should have the freedom to choose what to eat and what not to eat. And there's the problem. Strict regulation makes it difficult, if not impossible, to buy raw milk in some states in the US. Bringing it across state lines can actually land you in prison. Canada and Australia have gone so far as to ban the sale of raw milk countrywide. That means if you live in either of these countries and you want to see if raw milk can potentially improve your health, you'll probably find yourself in a Dallas Buyers Club type scenario. Raw milk is basically the narcotics of the food industry. But really, where did the stigma against raw milk even come from? Haven't people been drinking it for thousands of years? It turns out, we don't have an exact date or location for when and where humans began consuming raw milk. Some say milk dates back 9,000 to 11,000 years ago, somewhere between Western Asia and Western Europe. Others say that the earliest evidence is from modern-day Sudan and Kenya and dates back just 6,000 years. So it's safe to say that really we have no idea, but it probably happened at different times and in different places around the world. Likewise, we don't know the reason why humans began to drink milk in the first place. Some speculate that its high nutritional content could have been the main selling point of milking a cow, sheep, goat, or camel. Not only is raw milk high in protein, fat, and sugar, it also contains calcium, iron, vitamins A, D, and K, phosphorus, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids, conjugated linoleic acid, and an assortment of beneficial enzymes, bacteria, and antibodies. The antibodies alone could have been beneficial by providing early farmers with protection against viruses and diseases from animals. This isn't too crazy considering that we all got antibodies from our mom's milk when we were babies, assuming that we weren't exclusively fed formula. Others say that milk also provided a clean source of water for farmers for thousands of years. This source of clean water would have proved vital during droughts, failed harvests, or other natural disasters. Essentially, human populations probably started to drink milk out of necessity or desperation. Either way, it proved to be beneficial. The story goes that European populations and other cultures pretty quickly evolved to be able to digest the sugar in milk, lactose. People kept consuming it up until today, where even lactose intolerant populations are consuming more and more milk. This says a lot about the importance of milk as a source of nutrition. But it wasn't smooth sailing for milk throughout history. And the milk that most of the world drinks today isn't, well, raw. So when exactly did people stop drinking raw milk? Everything seemed to be going pretty well for regular, uncut raw milk up until the Industrial Revolution. As people stampeded into cities to work at factories, demand for food rapidly increased. And as was the custom for every business at the time, dairy farms industrialized and cows were forced to live in cramped, filthy urban farms instead of pastures. This made it way more likely that milk would come into contact with pathogenic bacteria. And this contaminated milk made its way into homes all over cities in North America. Come the 1800s, the infant mortality rate in the US skyrocketed. Milk was found to be the cause, but it turns out that not all raw milk was created equal at the time. Urban dairy farms in the Industrial Revolution were placed directly next to distilleries in an effort to boost profits. The leftover mash from the distilleries was fed directly to the cows next door as it was still steaming hot. This effort to boost profits had a number of issues. First off, cows are ruminants. Ruminants ferment grasses and pasture plants to get their nutrients. They don't like eating grains or corn or soy, and their digestive systems aren't really built to process them either. In fact, grain-fed cows have higher concentrations of E. coli and other harmful bacteria than their grass-fed counterparts. The cows at the industrialized dairies didn't want to eat the mash, so big business starved them until they had no choice but to eat it. The less than ideal, steaming hot diet led to rapid tooth decay and ridiculously short lifespans for the dairy cows. Cows can normally live up to 20 years, but in these urban dairy farms they died after just a few months. 
Not only that, they produced milk that was thin, bluish in color, and full of pathogens. Big business, never ceasing to see an opportunity no matter how bleak the outlook, added things like plaster, chalk, eggs, I'm assuming raw eggs, starch, and molasses to spruce up the color, texture, and flavor of the milk. This hot new milk hit the shelves labeled as pure country milk and was fed to families all over the country. Grandparents, parents, kids, babies, everyone was drinking it. And the infant mortality rate went through the roof. Some estimate that one in four infants died during the 1800s. The New York Times attributed 8,000 deaths due to this beacon of human ingenuity alone. But it wasn't exactly pure country milk. Sure, the base was technically raw milk, but the end product was some sort of franken beverage not fit for consumption by anyone or anything. It became known historically as swill milk. The swill milk scandal would eventually be unveiled by a journalist in 1858, and laws would be passed to ban putting additives in milk in 1875. By that time, scientists were dabbling in using pasteurization to preserve beer and wine, and would start to pasteurize milk as well. The transition from raw milk to raw milk from industrialized farms to swill milk to pasteurized milk makes it insanely difficult to figure out what the cause of the high infant mortality rate was in the 1800s. The solution, of course, was to solely blame raw milk and, as of the time of publishing this video, the Milk Wikipedia page has absolutely no mention of swill milk or its role in the deaths of countless people. Pasteurization does help to kill pathogens in raw milk from industrialized farms, but better sanitation in cities also helped to lower mortality rates in general. Whatever the cause of the high infant mortality rate in the 1800s, raw milk has taken the responsibility for it entirely. And as a result, the FDA and CDC still say, Healthy people of any age can get very sick or even die if they drink contaminated raw milk. So raw milk killed a bunch of people in the 1800s and probably killed a bunch of people before that. The first farmers to ever milk a cow and drink it must have died immediately afterwards. But what about today? Countries that consume raw milk and raw milk products like cheeses include France, Germany, Denmark, Italy, Ireland, and the United States. And the Amish in the United States have been drinking raw milk for centuries. It's estimated that about 3.2% of the US regularly drinks raw milk. That's about 10.5 million people. It turns out, a study from the CDC found that raw milk was linked to two deaths between 1993 and 2011. Just to be clear, that's two deaths in 19 years. The estimated number of deaths per year from listeria is about 260, and about 100 from E. coli. Extrapolate these over the same 19-year time period, and we get an estimate of 4,940 deaths from listeria and 1,900 deaths from E. coli. If you've looked at a newspaper even somewhat regularly over the years, you'd probably remember headlines about listeria outbreaks from mushrooms, or E. coli outbreaks from spinach or tomatoes, maybe even a couple of salmonella outbreaks, all from foods that are not raw milk. You might even recall tainted lunch meat contaminated with enterohemorrhagic E. coli that left several children with severe kidney damage. It turns out that one of the deadliest listeria outbreaks in the US that killed at least 28 people was linked to contaminated cantaloupes. The FDA and CDC warned that raw milk is especially deadly to the elderly, young children, and people with compromised immune systems. These groups of people in general are at a higher risk of contracting foodborne illnesses. So with 10.5 million people drinking raw milk regularly in the US alone, you'd expect to see more deaths considering the campaign to stop you from buying it, selling it, or drinking it. You'd also expect health authorities to crack down even harder on the foods responsible for the vast amount of deadly bacterial outbreaks. Instead, undercover detectives are being placed in raw food co-ops. One such co-op is Rossum Foods in Southern California. In 2010, Rossum had the pleasure of being raided at gunpoint by police officers who seized tens of thousands of dollars worth of perishable food items and dumped thousands of gallons of raw milk from the co-op. Managers were arrested for the particularly heinous crimes of selling raw milk and unwashed room temperature eggs. Even though members of the co-op were required to sign consent forms letting them know that raw milk and other foods at the co-op were unprocessed and could contain harmful strains of bacteria, none of the members got sick or died from the food they purchased through Rossum. Despite the lack of outbreaks or harm to public health, gun-toting police officers still felt the need to raid the co-op. 
While raw milk has been linked to disease outbreaks, a 2010 article from The Atlantic explains that other foods cause bacterial outbreaks far more frequently. The Price Foundation's website cites statistics showing that between 1990 and 2004, bacteria-contaminated produce caused 639 disease outbreaks in the U.S. Poultry, 541. Beef, 467. And seafood, 984. Between 1994 and 2008, there were only 85 disease outbreaks with raw milk, according to the FDA. If you combine the above foods with the fact that pesticides, seed oils, and processed sugars are landing scores of people in the ER, you might be wondering why the legislators are so heavy-handed on raw milk. And that's the big question. A later article from The Atlantic in 2011 tells us that while Rossum Foods was being raided at gunpoint, a deadly salmonella outbreak was tracked back to a multinational corporation named Cargill. Cargill's turkey processing plant put out a whopping 36 million pounds of turkey contaminated with salmonella. While the managers of Rossum were arrested, Cargill was never investigated and no one linked to the outbreak was charged with a crime. Rather, Cargill simply had to decide whether or not they wanted to issue a recall on the contaminated turkey. The article points to the idea that large food conglomerates can cause deadly outbreaks with little to no consequence, while, for some reason, small co-ops face the heavy hammer of the law. So, if strict laws are in place to keep us from buying raw milk, why do people buy it? Raw milk advocates claim that pasteurization changes the protein and fat structures in the milk, which makes it less digestible than raw milk. Scientists and the FDA refute this idea and say that pasteurized milk is just as good for you as raw milk and doesn't lose any of the nutrients in the process of pasteurization or homogenation. Considering that raw milk contains live enzymes and beneficial bacteria that get destroyed through pasteurization, it sounds like milk actually does lose some nutritional content through processing. In addition to this, some claim that raw milk helped them recover from autoimmune diseases and other health conditions where modern medicine hasn't worked. Others just want to consume food that hasn't been processed. Some even claim that it's helped them to get rid of their allergies. So whatever the case, the data doesn't exactly show that raw milk is a killer. If anything, history shows us that it's been a staple food for some cultures, and that the rise of industrial farming and widespread consumption of swill milk correlates with the increased infant mortality rate in the 1800s. Dig a bit deeper, and the statements demonizing raw milk start getting a little bit gray, a little bit uncertain. Maybe the high infant mortality rate was due to a combination of factors. It's not a binary issue. Very few issues are. Considering humans might have started to drink milk before they could digest it, and even cultures today, like those in Asia, that are historically lactose intolerant, are increasing their consumption of milk, there must be some benefit to it. The question is if raw milk is really a deadly food that should be avoided at all costs. After all, even healthy people can get sick or even die from drinking contaminated raw milk. So what do you think? If the sale and consumption of raw milk is restricted due to its potential dangers, should other foods be restricted as well? Should policies around the world restrict the types of food that we can put into our bodies, or do you think we should be able to decide for ourselves? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to support our channel. This has been The Maybe Theory, and as always, never stop asking questions.